So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Fiona Devine. I'm head of Alliance Manchester Business School at the University of Manchester. Uh, and I would like to extend a very warm welcome to you to this afternoon's Vital Topics Lecture. Let me take the opportunity to thank our series sponsors, DWF. Uh, I would very much like to thank the organization for their continued support for this series over a number of years. So today it gives me great pleasure to welcome our speaker, Marion Sudbury, OBE, who's Director of Regions for the Department for International Trade. Marion also sits on our advisory board here at Alliance Manchester Business School. Marion is a Cambridge graduate with an MBA from us here at AMBS. I'm very proud of that fact we are too. <laughs> Marion's background is as a senior business leader, and that is me means that she does bring incredible commercial acumen to her current role as director. Marion joined the Department for International Trade in January 2013, initially leading global operations and the Northern Powerhouse. She is now the director for English, English Regions, a national role which is focused on growing the UK economy by helping potentially high, business, high potential businesses learn and grow through doing business overseas and facilitating high quality global businesses create wealth by investing in the UK. Before that, <clears throat> Marion worked with major blue chip companies, charities and governments, defining organisational direction and designing and delivering short and long term commercial strategy. She joined the Greater Manchester Research Firm Business and Market Research PLC and became a board director in 2001 with special responsibility for international business and then set up their international division. Marion then worked for her own lifestyle business, which worked for clients in locations right across the globe. And after three very successful years of trading, she experienced at a personal level, the impact of the banking crisis. Her career in advising clients actually started um, and began in Istanbul, where she provided research uh, and advice to help companies such as EverReady, Mercedes and Avon Cosmetics understand to, how to operate in the Turkish market. In today's lecture, Marion will explore why governments, including the UK government, actively support exporting. She will discuss why governments partake in trade deals and how the UK government is helping businesses to export through trade deals and through export support. Facilitating the discussion this afternoon is my colleague, Professor Mario Koforis, who is Professor of International Business and Innovation and Head of the People Management and Organizations Division here at AMBS. Mario has extensive industrial and academic experience in the field of innovation and international business and strategy. His research draws on different disciplines such as economics, geography, law and sociology. It focuses on the determinants of internationalization and the consequences of certain international strategies for firm competitiveness, looking at the forces driving innovation and firm performance in the global economy and the mechanisms enabling multinational firms to benefit from technological developments. Now we've had actually a lot of pre-submitted questions, so we know that we're going to have an excellent conversation between Mario uh, and, and Marion in due course. So we have a lot to cover and without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Marion to her present. Thank you, Marion. Thank you, Fiona. Fantastic. Right, well, it's great to be here with you this evening. Uh, as Fiona said, I'm Marion Sudbury, and I'm here from the Department for International Trade to talk to you about exporting in the UK economy. Uh, so a couple of introductions first. So the department I come from, it's quite a new department. So it was only set up six years ago. And it's also quite a small one in government terms, only 4,000 or so people, um, some of them overseas. We have people in 108 countries overseas. Its mission is to secure UK and global prosperity by promoting and financing international trade and investment. 
and championing free trade. And for those of you that are not that familiar with government, I thought I'd just explain, it's got five ministers, including a secretary of state. So a secretary of state sits in the cabinet. And it's got two ministers who lead on trade policy, one who leads on um, investment and one who leads on export promotion. And again, for those of you who aren't familiar with how government departments work, ministers are the people who've been elected by the populace. So they set the policy and then civil servants like me work with them to implement it. And of course, we also provide uh, guidance on the pros and cons of different policy options. So that's how government departments work. Uh, this is a bit about me. You can see Fiona and I didn't coordinate uh, beforehand. <laughs> so I've probably told you again what she said there, but just to, to say that I graduated from the part-time MBA in 1996. I spent most of my career in marketing, advertising and market research um, as a board director, a senior vice president and a founder owner. Um, I've mainly worked in the north of England, but as Fiona said, I spent two and a half years in Istanbul in Turkey, helping foreign companies enter the Turkish market, which was really interesting. Um, and through my work, I've been involved in two acquisitions and with both setting up and exiting my own startup. And I've been in government for about 10 years. As you'll see from the second side of my timeline, I'm a serial self-educator. Uh, it's kind of something that yeah, I feel pretty passionately about. I really like learning new things and being a professional at what I do. So since my entire career has been in international business, either running businesses or working for government to help others do international business, that's an obvious topic for me to talk about today. And I'm gonna start by stepping back and reflecting on why governments actively support businesses um, in doing exporting and why they also do trade deals. And then I'm gonna look at the very many practical ways in which governments, or our government supports exporters. And then since it's an academic audience, I thought I'd finish by reflecting on some of the dilemmas that we face when we're making policy and the trade-offs that we have to make. And I'm hoping that some of you will have some ideas on things that we should be thinking about and want to contribute. So what's the role of DIT? This is quite a sort of technical slide, but um, it's very much a business facing department. And when it's deciding how to act, it uses a framework that's set out by the treasury, um, which looks at reasons why government would intervene in the economy. Okay. And as you can see, there are two particular reasons that we talk about in DIT. So one is what we call market failures. So that's where the market can't sort something out for itself for a variety of reasons. And the other is distributional failures. So, for example, you hear a lot about leveling up. That's a distributional failure. And just to be clear, commercial export support is available for businesses and it can, of course, help firms. But the evidence suggests it doesn't do everything that's needed. Um, and so, yeah, there is natural competitiveness between businesses and that can get in the way of firms helping each other with exporting. And it's also worth noting that quite a lot of trade is actually transacted between governments. For example, if a government's make, building a major infra infrastructure project, it will be interested in buying in inputs to that infrastructure project. So there's quite a lot of government to government trade. And then often the information that a firm needs to estimate the costs and benefits of exporting are quite expensive and time consuming for them to acquire. And so export promotion helps businesses to overcome those upfront sunk costs that are needed for exporting and which are exacerbated by the failures I've talked about. Just looking in a little more depth at the needs, the barriers that need government to intervene, this shows the, the key barriers that businesses tell us they have to exporting. Um, I should just explain one term on this slide. Uh, we talk about registered businesses. And so that means businesses that are registered to pay value added tax. So if you turn over more than £85,000 in the UK, you have to be registered for that. And that shows that you've got your firm to a, a certain stage of development. And so we carry out all our research on VAT registered businesses. And so what the slide shows you is that in terms of barriers, the biggest one is contact and network. So you'll all know that in your own country, um, it's quite easy to have contacts and networks. There's people that you grew up with, there's your neighbors, there's you know, all that kind of thing. But if you're doing business in a foreign country, you don't necessarily have those contacts and networks. It's kind of harder for you to build those up. Uh, the next barrier people gave us is costs. So 56% of registered businesses say that that's a barrier 
to them for exporting. And that's obviously interrelated with knowledge and capacity and contacts and networks because they all have a cost to acquire. Then knowledge, 54% said uh, lack of knowledge was a moderate or strong barrier. And then capacity, so having the capacity to actually take on the thinking and the doing of exporting. And what we find in our research is that these barriers particularly affect smaller firms. So bigger firms are more likely to have conquered these barriers themselves. But the majority of firms in the UK, 99% of firms in the UK are smaller firms. So we know those are the barriers, but why do, company, why do uh, governments actually want companies to export? Because we could just say, well, there's barriers, so let's just not do it. And so the answer to that question is basically good quality jobs. So almost all governments worldwide support firms to sell goods and services overseas. And that's because they support jobs and specifically higher paying jobs. So what we find is that businesses pay higher wages, about 7% on average, and they're 20% more productive than businesses who don't export. And of course, there's spillover effects on top of that, which is the other businesses that they do business with. Now, if you're wondering why, you're thinking, well, what's, why would I believe that? Why it is that exporting firms are more productive? Then what it is, is that we see that firms improve their skills by exporting and their knowledge. So for example, in my own experience, I set up the international division for a research firm. And when I started doing research studies overseas, I realized that, for example, my German and US colleagues carried out their studies very differently from the way that we did that. So that challenged my thinking and made me hone up my skills and think, huh, OK, so we don't have to do it the way people do it in the UK. You can do this differently. So I asked questions of our own business model, which I hadn't asked before. And then when firms do businesses overseas, they're exposed to a variety of buyers and sellers, and that opens new opportunities. So again, an example that we had was a company that made equipment, medical equipment, and it wanted to sell it to the NHS. Now, the NHS, as you'll know, is a market of more than 60 million people, so it's a big market. And to begin with, this company just wasn't big enough to be able to sell into the NHS because they wanted it to be a large order. So we helped them to sell overseas. They then built up their market base and then they were able to come back and sell into the NHS. So it can help you to build up your firm in a country which has different characteristics to your own. And so we see that time and again with firms that we work with. They learn things by doing business internationally and they get access to markets which may have advantages for them over the domestic market. So I've talked a bit about how the economy and businesses can benefit from exporting and that it's not easy for small businesses to do business overseas, especially to begin with. And providing a helping hand can make a big difference to how successful a firm is at exporting. So in the department, our projections suggest we'll reach as a country about one trillion in exports annually by the mid 2030s. And what we want to do is get there faster by supporting businesses to be ambitious in their approach and to be successful faster. So I'm now going to look at the ways that governments can help small and medium enterprises. And by the way, small and medium enterprises is something we talk about a lot, SMEs. So you'll probably hear me talk about SMEs. That's what I mean when I talk about them, small and medium enterprises uh, who make up, as I said, more than 99% of businesses in the UK and how we help them with their exporting. <clears throat> I'm going to start with what we might call the structural interventions. And that, by that, I mean trade deals. Um, and then I'm going to go on to the more behavioural and knowledge based interventions, which we address through trade promotion and trade support activities. So trade agreements, why do governments do trade deals? Well, when you do business internationally, one of the first things you come up against is the fact that other countries have got different cultures and practices, what we might call different um, institutional norms. So we are quite used to how our country decides if a product is safe, if a service is legal, how a tax is levied, what qualifications we recognize, but we don't know that for a foreign country in the same way. And that can be quite difficult to navigate, which is expensive. So for example, as an SME, when I ran my own SME, I turned down the chance of an ongoing contract with a major manufacturer because they wanted me to sign a contract in Delaware law. And I was quite concerned about signing a contract in Delaware law that that could bankrupt me. And so I didn't do it. And a friend of mine is currently banned from going to the US because he misunderstood uh, the laws about uh, how he was supposed to bill people over there, got it wrong, and he can't go. 
Another friend did a lot of business in Europe and kept finding that the standards um, in a particular country, the safety standards were all written for the domestic manufacturer of those goods. And that it was very, very difficult for someone else to break in because it was written in a certain way. And then of course, there's the more obvious ways that people keep people out, which is tariffs. So those kinds of barriers can be overcome or alleviated through the use of bilateral or multilateral trade deals, which we call free trade agreements or FTAs. We always have short term shorthand. So in free trade agreements or FTAs, countries agree to recognize each other's safety standards or each other's professional qualifications to make it easier to get entry visas for doing business in their country, to bid for contracts, government contracts, those types of things. And we can do a global trade deal, so looking at all those things with a, um, another country, or we can do just parts of them. So they're often called mutual recognition agreements, for example, when you recognize the other country's safety standards and they recognize yours. And a common under, um, sort of, yeah, a commonly held assumption is that smaller companies are less likely to use trade deals and preferential tariffs. But our analysis actually shows that small businesses can actually use those quite well and make good advantage of them. And so we want to build on that and really encourage small and medium enterprises to use free trade agreements to their advantage to overcome barriers to trade. So those are some of the structural ways in which we can help businesses. And moving on to the more behavioral side of our plan, we put in place something called the export strategy. It was published last autumn, 2021, and its stated aim was to grow exports faster than would be the case if we didn't intervene. It uses four principles to ensure that we're firmly embedded in the strategic ambitions of the UK and that the global opportunities that we address are the right ones. So strategically, the UK is interested in net zero, leveling up, shipbuilding, being a technology superpower. So these are all important things for us when we're considering how to support exports. Um, economically, we're looking at which markets, are there opportunities in which jive with the strengths of the UK? Uh, in terms of impact, we've got to decide how we prioritize who we support and how we avoid displacing the private sector in what we do. So just going through those two in a bit more detail, so how do we prioritize where government interventions make a difference? We've done quite a lot of homework on this. And broadly speaking, we divide firms into three types. There's the very large firms. And as I mentioned at the beginning, they are often very slick at exporting themselves. And there are certain things they need us to help them with, um, mainly to do with the, the trade deal type things I've talked about. Then there's the very small companies. So companies that aren't even VAT registered, they are born and die quite quickly um, and they may or may not have the capacity um, to grow through exporting. And then there's a middle group in particular companies that turn over about more than about half a million. We find they have scaled sufficiently to be able to then grow quite fast if we help them. And so they're our sweet spot which isn't to say we don't help the others, we do, but our sweet spot is those firms that have a product or service that could be exported and turn over more than half a million. So we refer to those as high export potential businesses. And then, as I mentioned, we also have to be conscious as a government that we're, we are intervening because there's a market failure. We don't want to displace activity that the private sector will do, so that you'll see that some of our programs are designed to help small businesses help other small businesses uh, with a view to them needing government less and less because that's our, in a perfect world, they wouldn't need us. So that's kind of where we're aiming for. Um, and then continuous improvement, we're always looking at feedback loops, you know, did what we do work, et cetera. So I'm gonna look in the at the strategy in a bit more detail. It's got a 12 point plan. Um, which was drawn up with and supported by UK businesses and business organizations. And it delivers practical services to help businesses improve their exporting capability and skills. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I am going to go through a number of the elements in this plan just to bring that alive for you. So we've got this campaign made in the UK, sold to the world. If we look at classic marketing principles, since there are about four and a half million businesses in the UK, many of them very small, and we want to reach as many of them as we can and encourage them to think about exporting, it makes sense to do a media campaign. So what this campaign aims to do is to shift attitudes towards exporting, encourage businesses to pursue international opportunities. 
So it wants to inspire businesses to consider and explore exporting for the first time and to inspire existing invest, uh, exporters to explore new markets. The campaign's in its infancy, it only launched recently, but we've got big plans for the year ahead. So we want it to raise a profile of exports across all parts of the UK. And we're gonna do that by featuring brilliant small and medium enterprises who have a great story to tell about exporting because we know that businesses like to hear from other businesses and they believe what other businesses tell them. So we work with companies of all sizes and all in industries who are internationalizing their businesses. And we're really proud that some of them are in this campaign. And that way we can harness the UK's exporting potential and make exporting feel possible and achievable. And this slide shows billboards, and that's just part of the mix, which has got a lot of social media and also some broadcast media. And it's also a campaign that can be tailored. We don't want this just to be our campaign. We want others to take it on, to use it, to make it their own. So instead of made in the UK, sold to the world, this one says sculpted in Manchester, watched on six continents. So we want people to take it on and put their own messaging in it in line with the broad campaign. And we want to localize it into different parts of the country. And the campaign will then help to signpost businesses to the support they need so that they can seize exporting opportunities across the world's fastest growing markets. And then we're also including, as well as advertising and marketing, all of our export promotion programs underneath this headline to underpin it. So events will be branded with this masterclasses, webinars, trade missions, meet the buyer sessions, visits to businesses and so forth. So that's encouraging businesses to think about exporting. And once we've encouraged them, we want to provide them with the know-how and confidence to export. But we need to do that in quite a light touch way for the small businesses who might be at a very early stage in their journey. They might not have that much time to give to us. It might take them quite a while to think through how they want to do it. And a key vehicle for doing that is our new Export Academy. So it's a learning and development program designed for owners and senior managers of businesses across the UK who are interested in either starting to sell internationally or looking to grow their international sales further. Once they've undertaken the foundation course, which is the green arrow on the left, and then all those modules underneath are the modules in that course, then that they can look at particular sectors and countries, the blue arrow um, and digital masterclasses. And then later, the brown arrow is specifically about preparing people to go to trade shows, which I'll talk about later on. Um, so in the first instance, as per the green, um, sorry if anybody's colorblind, I should have thought of that, my husband's colorblind, but anyway, in the first instance, we want to communicate the basics. So researching which markets you go to, setting your pricing strategy, understanding customer procedures and tariffs or customs procedures and tariffs, all that kind of thing. And um, mostly the Export Academy is visited, uh, is um, delivered online, so through Microsoft Teams, but we do also get people together and these are people coming together for the Export Academy. And I just wanted to give you a quote from a business because I thought it was quite interesting. It's a services sector business. And this company said, the DIT Export Academy has given me an awareness of what I need to do to find new clients in the USA, how to conduct market research, ways to avoid common pitfalls, and the barriers and opportunities open to businesses exporting their services. I, like a lot of people, thought that exporting was just for big firms sending goods abroad, but there's massive potential for firms like mine to sell their expertise abroad. And that's a PR company who realized that they could do so much more. Um, so as I said, it's delivered on Teams, but it's delivered in a live way. There's a moderator who is an experienced in international business themselves so that people have got someone to interact with. Um, we've had, I think 7,000 registrations um, so far, even though it's in quite early stages, and 35% of the people who register have never exported before. So it's reaching out to new people. Um, most SMEs start exporting um, by reacting to incoming international orders, but what we want them to do is actually to proactively plan, because as in so many things in life, people who actually have a plan are more likely to do more faster. And so what one of the things we're really trying to do with this Export Academy is to make sure that everyone who graduates from it has a plan for exporting. So they've really thought through what they're going to do. We get them to fill out that plan. And if we know that if we can equip small business owners with global ambitions early on um, and give them the skills and knowledge they need, 
then they will meet their potential much more quickly. So one of the things that the Export Academy also does is signpost people to our digital services. So it's a panacea for everybody to get everybody to self-serve digitally. But actually, if you're running a small business and you're working, you know, 90 hours a week already, then trying to work your way through a, a digital website can be pretty hard. So one of the things we want to do is to make it easier for people by taking them through it pointing them to relevant materials as opposed to them having to work out what's relevant, helping them to understand what they can do. And there are, I, I'll leave you to go onto the, the website itself because there's a lot of material on there. But for example, um, we've created a tool which can help a company to choose a market and create a tailored plan for entering that market all on their own computer screen. So this is something that people can do at any time of the day or night, they can do it themselves, they can go through this. And there are lots of other materials on the digital platform um, and there isn't time to go through them all today. So those are two important things, the Export Academy and the digital platform. And we'll come on to a number of other services, but before I go on to them, we listened to businesses who said, right, you've got lots of services, that's great, but I get a bit confused because you've got services, other people have got services, where do I go? And so we listened to them and we said, OK, you want easier access to government services. We hear that. And so we've created one front door which people can go to. If they're not sure where to go, they can go in anywhere. By the way, there's no wrong front door. But if they're not sure where to go, they can go to the export support service, which is a place um, where they can call up a hotline or they can email us and we will answer whatever question they have. So they will get bespoke questions answered um, and, you know, they can ask us where, where to go to get information or they can ask us to actually answer a particular question through both this helpline and an online service. So it's an integrated system of support. Originally, it was just for questions to do with Europe. Um, and then we added Russia and the Ukraine. And now it answers questions about anywhere in the globe. Um, and... One of the things it does, which is really important, is to bring together different government services, because I'm, I'm telling you about DIT services, but for example, um, some of the critical things that people need to know about um, exporting plants or animals are with DEFRA, a different department. Some of the critical things to do with taxes are with HMRC, a different department. So there are different parts of government, and what the Export Support Service can do is find answers to questions from any department and that's what it commits to do so that you don't have to get passed from department to department to um, answer your questions. Um, and then sitting behind it is a dedicated policy team and they, they record all those challenges, they answer as many of them on the phone straight away as they can, they go away and find answers if they can't. And then they think about which questions are coming up regularly and whether there are any policy changes we need to make, whether there are any informational changes we need to make. So I've talked about our media campaign to encourage businesses to think about exporting, talked about the Export Academy to teach them the basics in a cost-effective way in the digital platform as well. And then the ESS, the Export Support Service, as a single front door, but also to answer, answer tricky cross-government questions. And that's available to everyone. So we then have some businesses as I mentioned earlier, with the potential to scale fast, these high export potential businesses. And that's where what we call international trade advisors come in. So what those businesses that have the potential to scale fast most want is an advisor and critical friend who's got the experience of exporting themselves and can help them on the journey. Some people describe them as like, you know, they are an addition to my firm. They're like my exporting department. Of course, they don't just work for one firm. They work for lots of firms, but they provide that input. And these on screen are some of our Northwest trade advisors. So Jenny uh, covers digital, creative and tech. Um, Christos covers Greater Manchester and the sort of working with Greater Manchester on exporting on the local action plan. And then Margaret is um, in the picture with the mayors. We did a recent trade mission with the Metro mayors of Manchester and Liverpool, uh, Liverpool city region uh, to Dublin. And so for businesses with the potential to grow and especially the high export uh, potential businesses, these trade advisors provide bespoke support to build their exporting capability and develop the confidence to expand overseas. And they can help people through the technicalities of trade, point them in the right direction for support, um, 
in our in-market teams, help them access finance, all kinds of things. So I was at an event last week where a business spoke in glowing terms about how her ITA had helped her pivot markets when European buyers were becoming skittish about her product and focus on the US instead. She, they screened markets with her and they decided the US was a good one. And then she was going to sign a distributor contract in the US and she was, wasn't quite sure, it's a five-year contract. So she got the trade advisor to review the contract and just do a little bit of homework on the, um, on the particular company and avoided a costly mistake uh, because they, she did not sign with that firm in the end, she signed with someone else and that's going really well. So it's, it's a bespoke tailored service to um, the particular needs of that firm. And from July of this year, two months away, uh, we're bringing our international trade advisor service in-house because uh, at the moment it's with contractors and so that we want to integrate it with other aspects of our export support so that we can really make this more seamless for businesses um, and give you know, high quality consistent advice across the piece. So that's trade advisors. So I mentioned that we want businesses to become self-sufficient and learn how to do things themselves and also to support other businesses. And the internationalization fund is one of the ways in which ITAs might refer somebody on. They might help them to apply for the internationalization fund. So it was launched in December 2020 and it helps exporters to buy from other small and medium firms to buy in services from other small and medium firms. So it leverages the European Regional Development Fund to offer co-investment support. So if a firm's willing to put anywhere between a thousand and nine thousand pounds, the fund will match that and that allows them then to spend double. So the rationale for this is that um, in the 2008 recession, um, quite a lot of people stopped buying in business services. It was the kind of purchase that you could delay if you were struggling and then it didn't really recover afterwards and so one of the things we really wanted to do here was encourage businesses to buy from other small businesses and therefore it's a gift that gives twice if you like and so far we've allocated 17 million pounds in funds and it's forecast as a scheme to create more than 5,000 jobs and so examples of how it's been used was a card payment service who use the um, funding to help them establish a presence in their target market through market visits and specialist support to build contacts and also to internationalize their website. Quite a lot of people need to make their website more internationally friendly. There's a Manchester based chemical company who use the funding to build international awareness and growth by buying in social media expertise from a, um, a, another small and medium enterprise and a food and drink company who brought in specialist advice on intellectual property and packaging for designs to use in the US. So there are different ways that you can use this fund and buy from other small and medium enterprises. So then another way that ITAs can then signpost businesses on, help businesses to learn things which make them stronger for the future is to refer them to the UK trade show programme. So that's designed to encourage businesses to attend or exhibit at key trade shows while helping them how to understand how to use free trade agreements and realize those benefits. So we know that exhibiting at a trade show for the first time can be daunting and attending an international show is a big commitment by a business, both in money and time. And you wanna get that right and get the return on investment. So I know the first time I went to a trade show um, in the business where I was a board director, I had to explain in intimate detail to my fellow directors that it wasn't a jolly, um, that I did believe I would gain new clients. I had done my homework and I knew who was going to be there. Um, and they were keen to point out that if I didn't get any new clients, we would have wasted our money. <laughs> we did get some new clients, so it was okay. But so the UK trade show programs here to sort of support SMEs that first time round so that they do understand how trade shows work and they can really maximize what they do at those events. So you don't want to just rock up at an event cold. You want to have done your homework first know who you're targeting when you get there so for those who'd like to visit a trade show to get insight on how it works and decide if they want to exhibit there in future we help them and secondly people who already know that they want to exhibit so we give them advice on how to succeed at the trade show access to DIT's network of businesses and activities at the show. And that, by the way, if you're an SME can be really important. If there's lots of other British firms there and they're big firms, then it can kind of look like you're bigger, which is an SME is quite helpful. Um, and then in some cases, there's funding towards the costs. And then I also showed you that the um, Export Academy has modules on this to help people plan. And SMEs will have to apply for this on or do apply for this on a competition basis. And they're chosen because they're the most innovative and best strategic fit for that event for the UK. 
um, and they can only get it once because this really is to help people learn so that they can then justify where they're doing it next time and do it efficiently. And then for businesses who get to the stage where they really know that they want to go to a particular market, they've done their plan, they've done their homework, um, and they know they want to go, we've got um, an international service in our nine trade commissioner regions around the world. Um, and that helps them basically to, it gives them some off the shelf information, background information about how that market is different from other markets that they might be doing business in. There's a, um, some free personal advice as well about um, how to do business in that country in your particular market. And then we also have a register of um, a private sector businesses that that firm can work with to buy in services so that that gives them a quick way to understand that market and enter it. And then we have, as part of our services, um, a strategic partnership with UK Export Finance. So UK Export Finance, its mission is to ensure that no viable UK export fails for lack of finance or insurance. And broadly speaking, it de-risks exporting in three ways. It provides attractive financing terms to the buyers that a company has. It supports working capital loans to help fulfill contracts, and it ensures against buyer default. It's got finance managers around the UK to help businesses understand what supports available and also overseas. Provided 12.3 billion in support in 2020-21, supporting 500, nearly 550 companies exporting to 77 countries around the world. Um, and it's it, working hard to increase its work with SMEs. Uh, so I think typically credit agencies do a lot of work with bigger companies and it wants to do work with small and medium enterprises. Um, and so the loans are done in conjunction with banks who are sometimes quite cautious about who they loan to. So they're looking at various challenger banks and how to work with them. And they've also got a new thing called the general export facility, which instead of just being working capital loans for a specific export, it will, it's working capital loans to help you more generally be ready to export. So those are some of DIT's services. Um, and I mentioned when I talked about the Made in the UK campaign that we want others to amplify what we do. The more that other people do, the less that we have to do, um, and the less that you as taxpayers have to pay for us to do. So it's um, something that we want to do. And an example of this is our peer-to-peer -peer network of export champions. So this is a community of over 400 successful business people who are passionate about making a difference. They've been helped by DIT already, and they want to pay it forwards and help others. And so their role as business leaders, they can be CEOs, sales directors, export managers, that complements the on the ground support provided by our ITAs, and it helps us to promote exporting to, exporting to a much wider business base. So these people take on a wide range of responsibilities on our, our behalf. So they participate in round tables, with speaker slots and engagements, work with the media on, um, and feed into policy that affects business. And we look to them to inspire new and fledgling exporters through networking, encouraging, sharing hints and tips, um, both in person and through WhatsApp and LinkedIn. So for example, if we're encouraging people to look at the Latin American market, we might have a panel of export champions who will take questions from businesses who are interested in Latin America about things that they're finding difficult or that they think they might find difficult and what can these people tell them about it. So we also use them as sounding boards to test new ideas and content like future digital information, um, provide business insights, for example, on the export strategy, um, free trade agreement consultations um, and various other things. Um, and there are 13 export champions in Greater Manchester. I'm not sure that any of them are here today, but if they are, then thank you very much. Um, and uh, on here, you can see Minister Freer, who is our export minister and a native um, of Greater Manchester with one of our export champions there on the slide. Um, in fact, this is what one of our export champions it makes these fantastic plastic instruments. So they're massive, what are normally massive brass instruments that are really heavy and really expensive, made out of really cheap, lightweight, much cheaper lightweight materials, doing a phenomenal business in it. And this is what he basically says about exporting. So he encourages people to immerse themselves in exporting, to learn everything they can about it. So, you know, 
wander around those the supermarkets, the shopping malls, go to the sporting events, those types of things, so that you really get under the skin of the country that you're exporting to. And I think that's extremely good advice there um, from a very successful exporter. So in terms of other people that support us, um, we also have what we call trade envoys. This is the 10th anniversary of us having trade envoys. Um, for anybody that's not familiar with that program, the Prime Minister's trade envoys are parliamentarians. They're drawn from both houses. They're drawn from across the political spectrum. Their aim is to grow bilateral trade with specific markets and to support British businesses to export and help attract inward investment. And so their convening power comes from their status as having been appointed by the Prime Minister. And they complement the wider work of the ecosystem that I've talked about by leveraging their high level relationships in markets to open doors for UK businesses. And working with colleagues from across our department, they undertake a wide range of engagements, leading trade delegations, one-to-one -one meetings with senior government ministers in their markets, supporting activity on trade policy and market access issues, hosting inward delegations and dignitaries, meeting key businesses in markets, and keynote speeches at business events and highlighting UK opportunities in their markets. So there are currently 36 trade envoys covering 76 markets. They don't have any policy responsibility and policy decisions are a matter for our ministers. And they also don't have responsibility for trade negotiations, but they do input to a lot of things. So there are, that's a lot of services I've run through and there are more in particular specialist sector support. I can't really do justice to all of them in the time allowed. So rather than going into more details of individual services, I thought just to give you an idea of how the various services come together, I would take you through a couple of customer journeys. Um, and they are in an ideal world, how things could work. Um, and some of them are current, some of the more automated parts are a little bit futuristic, we're working on them. So this first one is a gearbox manufacturer from the Northeast. Uh, the company turns over about 12 million pounds. It's done some sales to France and Germany, but it's never done anything more. So a new sales director arrives, he calls up the export support service, the ESS, to clarify some paperwork for Germany, which has changed since we left the European Union. And the advisor can easily answer that query, but sorts it out on the call. When the advisor records the company's details on our customer relationship management system, with permission, obviously, this identifies that the company would benefit from specialist advice. And so an ITA, an international trade advisor, is assigned to the company. The ITA suggests that a sector export academy event would help the company develop its exporting faster. And from that, the sales director, from that event, the sales director realizes that Vietnam would be a target market for them. So he works on that market with the ITA, um, who refers him to the in-market support service team for local advice. They give him some off-the-shelf information and then refer him to the private sector suppliers, and he chooses one for legal advice that he needs. And he's then in a position to sign a deal with a car, um, Vietnamese sports car manufacturer. So that's an example of how a high export potential business might go through some of DIT services. And the second example is a much smaller company turning over just 300,000 pounds. It begins its journey by registering on our website, great.gov.uk. Founders never exported before, but a mate of hers suggests she could grow her business faster if she did. So she does some online learn to export modules and they suggest that she'd benefit from going to the Export Academy. She does that course, the foundation course, and completes an export action plan. And that, from that, she decides she needs to do some specific homework on Canada as a good market for her. And she goes to the online tool that we have called Find a Buyer, and she finds a buyer in Canada and gets some work in Canada. She's also identified by our CRM system as someone who'd benefit from going to a trade show in Belgium. She gets some training on how to prepare that, and then... Because of that, she meets with a buyer when she goes to the trade show from a major company who's keen to bring in more new creative talent to their supplier base and asks her to bid on part of a worldwide contract. So those are just two examples of how companies might go through some of our services. So just bringing that all together, DIT, I think I've probably outlined to you by now, provides a complex ecosystem of support. The government's keen to do this because it recognizes that citizens benefit from better quality jobs when firms do international business. The export support system is designed to overcome barriers and can make exporting less risky for individual firms. And it's a mixture of structural support, free trade agreements, 
and mutual recognition agreements and behavioral support. So encouragement, training, support, nudge funding and peer-to-peer -peer support. At every stage, the IT is conscious to avoid crowding out what the private sector and other actors want to do. We want to encourage other people to be involved in this space. And we're always conscious of the need to keep it as simple as we can for business and not change things too often. So that's what we do. And given that this is a business school audience, I wanted to just finish by touching on some of the dilemmas that we face. So dilemmas which those in the room may want to talk to me about later, which would be great. So the first of those is cost versus reach. So with limited budgets, how do we reach wide, reach every single firm that, we, that could po possibly export and deep, give more support to firms that scale fast? As I mentioned, the UK has got a very large number of small companies and a very small number of large companies. And so we're asking ourselves, what can we deliver one to many? What can we deliver digitally? Um, how do we focus? And as I've told you, we focus on high export potential companies for our one-to-one -one support. Uh, are we getting the balance right? It'd be really interesting to think about um, the ways that we look at that and whether we are doing the right choices and whether we all are also maintaining sufficient flexibility to pick up nascent industries and help them to grow. The second is around complexity. So we want to continuously improve, but we know that if you keep changing what you do, businesses find it more difficult to work out what support they can get and they get frustrated with that. So we have to be careful about um, simplicity. And complexity also gives us like a dilemma with, um, as I mentioned, not crowding out other players. We don't want to crowd out other players, but if this player only does this in one city, how do we then make sure that we don't crowd their services whilst at the same time still delivering that in the other cities which don't have that offer? So we're constantly thinking about that, which leads to quite a lot of complexity for us. Finding a system which intersects with all the others in different ways is quite complex. And the ESS as our front door is a, a way to help with that, but it would be very interesting um, to think about uh, other ways of looking at it. Leveling up is a really complex area when it comes to exports. Um, you know, do you prioritise major geogra geographic blocks, the north, the northwest, or do you uh, prioritise niche geographies, Barrow and Furness? You know, so we're constantly thinking about those things. And what are the limits to what exporting can do? for um, leveling up and then measurement. So as you've seen, we have multiple interventions. So you saw those customer journeys. It takes multiple inter interventions to turn someone into a confident exporter. So if you've made multiple interventions, how do you know which ones worked? And you know, without stopping doing some of them for five years and seeing if things change, which might not be a great thing to do. Um, and then how do you strip out noise? You know, so currency movements change, how much people export. So how do we strip that out? So food for thought. Thank you very much for listening today. I hope you found that useful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. A, a warm welcome from me as well. I can see lots of familiar faces, but uh, <laughs> for those of you who don't know me, and as Fiona, our head of school, mentioned, I'm Mario Kafour, I'm a professor of international business and innovation. That was very, very interesting. <laughs> I, I, I mean, as a professor of international business, I'm uh, attending uh, naturally lots of international business conferences, and right. uh, therefore I have attended probably hundreds of presentations on exporting, uh -huh. uh, but that was different because it was very, very practical. Right. Uh, I, I, I've got a list of uh, pre-submitted questions, Ooh, okay. quite a few. Okay. Example, <laughs> interesting presentations come with lots of questions. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, uh, but I, I'd like to start from a practical one. Yeah. Uh, to some extent, you gave us a flavor of how firms uh, do it, but uh, especially for smaller or medium-sized firms, it can be a daunting exercise. Sure. And the first question I've got here is, what are the logistics involved? So different, let's say I run a, a small firm and I produce clothes or bags or whatever it yeah. is. What are the steps that I need to take in order to export abroad? Sure. Well, I think the first thing that you need to do is to think about where you're exporting and why you're exporting to that particular place. So you need to think about which countries you want to go to. 
Um, and to do that, I would, depending on your preference, either go on great.gov.uk, which is the, the website that I described, which has tools to help you think that through, or you could go to the Export Academy, which is where, if, if you prefer interacting with people, um, then there's more interaction at the Export Academy. So I would go to one of those routes and I would think through where you want to go and what the choices are that are involved and make a plan. Then once you've made your plan, you want to do some homework on the particular country that you're planning to go to, you know, to do with, you know, what, yeah, just how that how that country works. Mm -hmm. There's quite a lot of um, homework on that. And also at the moment, of course, you'd want to do uh, checks on COVID rules, foreign office advice, depending on the, you know, the, the country that you're thinking of going to. So I think the answer is homework. That's what I would advise any company that was thinking of doing business internationally, but we can help you do that homework. Because I know from writing, <clears throat> the first international strategy that my firm had that looking at that blank sheet of paper was quite hard this was pre-internet um but actually it's it's not that hard now we've got ways to help you put that plan together so i would take advantage of one of those ways and do a plan i've seen there is a lot of support and i was wondering you know as, as you were presenting and again i'll return back to that very practical very simple way of doing things and let's say okay i'm uh, manufacturing a good and and knock on your door and do the courses and yeah. think about those mm. things. There is, of course, naturally a lot of complexity. Countries differ, sure. legislation differs, and lots of other things differ. Uh, but I was also wondering, how do you manage to connect? And I think that's the, 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 the biggest, perhaps one of the biggest challenges. How do you manage to connect me as a firm to potential buyers? Mm. Because I suspect, you know, there will be many like me who want to export abroad. And... Sure. Well, there are lots of different ways, but a couple of the main ways are we have meet the buyer events in the UK where we bring buyers over from overseas and then they meet with companies who might want to find out about um yeah, who are interested. We also take buyers overseas sometimes to meet with major firms overseas. So, for example, if, um, if, yeah, if a large manufacturer is looking for something in its supply chain, and we know that we've got that. We might take a group of buyers over who can offer that. So there are those types of things. And then there's the, the trade shows and events that I mentioned, where if you do your homework properly beforehand, they can be a good place to meet buyers. But generally speaking, well, you want to know who's going to be there and you want to affix the meetings before you go. If you're going to meet them, don't just show up on spec. Your chances of meeting the right person are probably quite slim if you do that. So you okay. want to do your homework first. So therefore, I suspect a big challenge for you and part of your role would involve identifying these potential buyers from abroad and from different countries. And right. in some cases, yeah. make sure that you bring them here to or vice versa to, to meet our yeah. um, So our sector teams, who I didn't talk um, about in any detail, they're the people that tend to, to identify uh, the buyers to bring them over here or the buyers overseas to take people to. And then UK Export Finance, they also do meet, meet the buyer events. And then my, t my teams identify the firms in the UK who might take part in that. Do you see what I mean? So that's a kind of matching exercise which the whole department gets involved in. It sounds very complex, of course. I don't Sorry, want... I didn't mean to, mean to make it sound complex, but it is quite complex. It yeah. is complex, <laughs> but what I want to say is that we cannot avoid that complexity. And I mean, for various reasons, we have seen you know, lots of things changing more recently yeah. in the global economy across many, many countries. So a, a follow-up question that I've got here, because of such changes in the global economy, as well as in the UK, have these logistics and processes that you referred to earlier, have those things changed? changed. Or is, mm. ha, has it involved? I know we were chatting earlier uh, and you were telling me it's now 10 years, right? In, yeah. In, in, so, uh, is it different? Is, is it mm. different? How has this in, evolved over time or is it kind of the same principles there and if people as you say do their homework they will succeed have, have this process changed yeah it's interesting i think the principles are the same i think doing that homework i think what's changed um so obviously covid is still a slight 
well, has, has changed things a lot because of the Teams revolution or the, the Zoom revolution. So the fact that you can talk to people on Teams or on Zoom makes a huge difference. Um, I still think, um, well, most firms tell me that it's better to go and actually meet people in person when you are drumming up business, but still in between, you can follow up on Teams and you can do things on Teams that you couldn't before. And I know a lot of Northern companies have found it's easier to do business in the South, for example, and talk to people in the South. But, uh, but I would say that the fundamentals of how you export and you know what the export champion put up about, get to know your market, immerse yourself in the market, really get into the headspace of that market. I think that's still correct. Okay, okay. I was wondering also the, an, an interrelated question. Uh, ha, has your role changed in that respect? Uh, go to those changes or you yeah. go back, I don't know, seven, eight years. Right. How well, I'm doing a different job than I did seven, eight years ago. So in that sense, my role has changed. But over the last four years since I've been doing this job, has the role changed? I think because we became a department in 2016 and we added trade policy and negotiating trade deals. Previously, we were we just had the sale, the export promotion part. So adding trade policy has made that very different. So we think a lot more about trade deals and how to make sure that people access trade deals. We did some of that before, but it's a much higher priority perhaps than it was before. So that probably has changed in, in that regard. And then <clears throat> what we've been trying to do over the last couple of years is just make accessing export support simpler, because as you say, it is complex. And so we've been working really hard to try and make it so that it's simpler and so that it reaches everyone without, without um, stopping us from putting real time into those businesses that we think can scale fast. So trying to have our cake and eat it, really. Yeah. I think in my view, yeah, managing that complexity is key because I remember I, I was doing for many years an executive course on international strategy and yeah. internationalization. And always I had companies, especially smaller ones, coming to me saying, wow, there is a lot going on here. Where do we start? How do we manage all those things? Right. Where do we find information for all those different right. variables that you know naturally will vary across countries? Yeah. In some cases, they will vary across, uh, or even within countries and across regions of yeah. a country. So I, I'm, I'm, I, I suspect managing that yeah. uh, th those challenges it will be. Yeah. Well, I think if you're if you're at base zero you know, and you've done nothing on it, then going to the Export Academy will be the right place because it will very quickly give you an overview of the key challenges and some tools for managing them. And then I would strongly recommend once you've got your plan together, doing some research. Um, so for example, if you can use the internationalization fund to match fund, buying in some research where perhaps a company can screen five different markets for you and tell you which ones are best suited um, for your product or service. Mm -hmm. You know, those types of things, they pay back doing those types of things yeah as you were presenting i, I also noted down that there are a number of partners and, and right. collaborators that yeah. support you can, can you tell us a little bit more about them so yeah uh, how, how do you work together so if let's say if i go back to this initial example if i come to you as a firm right and, and start taking those steps where do your partners and people who support come in yeah, well, so our aim is to have as straightforward as possible a national offer, but then to work with people locally on the local add-ons, because mm -hmm. what we find actually is a lot of um, locally, a lot of organizations are interested in inward investment, but less interested in exporting. We think this is a mistake. We think people should be really, really interested in exporting. But I mean, it's not that it's a mistake to be interested in inward investment. I should correct myself there. That is important, but it's also important to think about exporting. And so what we try and do is work with local areas on an exporting plan. Mm -hmm. So it, we put together the best of what we already know with what they know locally to put together a joint plan. So for example, we've done one for Greater Manchester, we've done one with Liverpool. And so that's that's a really good way of doing it so that the two sides come together to put together a plan. And then we also work with organizations like the Federation of Small Businesses, um, and the IOD, the CBI, all of those organizations to, to hear what they have to say and they contribute to our export strategy, for example, and then we work with them wherever we can and chambers of commerce we work with as well. So that, you know, for example, when I talked about made in the UK, sold to the world, 
we want those people to take that on. If they want to take it on and make it their own, that would be fantastic as far as we're concerned. So that's what we're trying to do. And with the Export Academy, we're thinking about how can we get, once we've got it really humming, how can we then get others to deliver it? So lots and lots of people deliver mm -hmm. the Export Academy. And the client knows, the business knows they're going to get a certain quality. So there have to be some kind of franchising involved, I guess. You know, But at the same time, it's not limited by how much DIT can do. So that's where we want to get to. I think you've given us a very <laughs> good flavor of the process. So uh, I'll move now to a, a slightly different question, pre-submitted uh, question. Okay. Uh, the question is just that obviously, as we all know, we live in a world of technology transfer and research commercialization, and therefore the export of intellectual property is a must, is mm. a requirement. Uh, the National Security and Investment Act coming into force this year has created a new level of bureaucracy to an already challenging process in this regard. That's understandable. What would be your advice for universities uh, <laughs> in dealing with this new legislation? He asked me some difficult That's questions. That's very close to our hearts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, look, this new legislation, um, as I understand it, just matches us up with what Europe and the US already do. Um, so it's not sort of onerous legislation. And it's uh, owned by the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. And I believe they have support for people that want to understand it better so that's what my advice to you as a university would be would be talk to base <laughs> yeah no, if you need help with finding someone i can help with that of course <laughs> thank you for for that help is always welcome uh, as i was saying earlier there are lots of changes in the global economy and across yeah. many countries and my next question is is about the current trade environment. What, what, what is what is it like? And obviously, you know, we can observe some of those changes, but very often the biggest challenge is actually to spot those opportunities or those difficulties that firms yeah. uh, face. So, in your view, what are the biggest opportunities and challenges for UK businesses? Right. I know there are lots of <laughs> yeah. opportunities and challenges, but from your experience, at least. I think that's that's actually um, a very sector specific. <clears throat> um, there's a very sec there's, there are a range of sector specific answers to that. I suppose one of the things that I would say is a real opportunity for British businesses is just how um, strong a cachet our products and services have. So people will often say, I really want this to have been made in the UK or I want that to be a service that's provided from the UK. And, and so don't underestimate that, actually, how often that matters overseas. Mm. And so that is an advantage that opens doors, the fact that you have a British product or a UK product or service. So I would say that that's probably the biggest opportunity that people don't necessarily recognize because we're really great at talking ourselves down in the UK and saying that we're not great at things, but we are actually great. And people know that and we should really trade on that, I think. That's uh, <laughs> very interesting. It also reminds me a little bit of international business on, on country of origin and yeah. how that matters. Yeah. And really. in terms of challenges? Challenges. Um, well, obviously, the, the whole COVID picture mixing all the time and changing all the time is a challenge. Although, you know, if you do your homework on that, then, you know, it's a challenge that can be easily met. Um, so I would have said that that's probably the other big challenge. And then, of course, you know, there are things like Russia, Ukraine are very specific challenges for specific firms, you know, and sanctions and so forth. So, yeah. Uh, I'd like to go back also to the point you were making earlier about uh, different sectors. And I mean, yeah. it's, it's indeed mm -hmm. very, very true. Lots of these things are sector or industry specific. And one of my hobbies is to look at those statistics every now and then for different industries. Yeah. Of course, that's easy. You know, it's easy for me to download the data and look at the data and, uh, and observe these variations. But of course, what is more challenging is to spot opportunities within those sectors. Right. And I was wondering from, from your experience and the, the, the things that you see on a daily basis, where do you see growth in and in which sectors? 
Is there any particular? <laughs> <laughs> so I wouldn't dare make a prediction about okay. which sectors would grow or not grow. I mean, that that is, you know, there are there are a lot of people who are better qualified to make those predictions than me, I think. So I, I think I mentioned that there are sort of areas that government is is keen to promote. Mm -hmm. So, for example, net zero is definitely an area where we see growth and the, where, you know, we're keen to promote that. Science superpower. So, you know, the, the, the scientific base that we have in the UK is really important. Shipbuilding is something that we have a new strategy for. So that's something that we think is, is really important and is also good for our coastal cities mm -hmm. um, as part of um, a sort of levelling up. Um, I've forgotten one because I know there are four. It'll come back to me. So, you know, there are a number of things which government is keen to promote. So I guess from that point of view, getting behind those agendas. Oh, leveling up is the final one, of course. Getting behind those agendas is well worth doing because those are things that we will be putting um, energy behind as well. OK, OK. Yeah. I move to the next question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Am I being too direct in my answers? I wonder that there are quite a few questions. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the next one, however, is also very interesting, and there are significant changes, uh, as we were discussing earlier, but especially in the last two or three years, I mean, mm. there has been a lot. I was reading a, a, an article in the Financial Times yesterday, trying to get the title right, uh, the horror that is 2022. Oh dear. That, that was a bad year. <laughs> and of okay. course, it's not just 2022 and what is going on, but we had COVID. Uh, we have very high levels of persistent inflation, even though many central banks thought that that inflation is not, is, is not going to be persistent. We've got uh, significant disruptions in uh, global supply chains. More recently, we've got an energy crisis. And of course, on top of that, we've got a war that has yeah. no consequences yeah. for food production, food yeah, price. True. So there is a lot going on. There is a lot going on. Is now a good time to export? <laughs> <laughs> or um, should firms just say, OK, there's a lot of volatility. Uh, I'll wait this out to just right. You know, that's interesting. Yeah, actually, you remind me of a headline I saw a few years ago, which said, will the British die of too much news? And <laughs> it does feel sometimes like we get too much news at the moment, doesn't it? Um, I think there are always opportunities and threats at any given time. And I think that, um, as I've mentioned, I, th I think there are opportunities for UK companies to export. I think it, it makes sense to do your homework and to think carefully about it. If you're worried about particular risks of particular markets, then that's where UK export finance comes in. You know, so if, you, if you're thinking of doing a big contract and it's in, uh, I'm not going to name a specific market, but a market that's known to have structural risks, then it's well worth working with them. Um, so I think if you, if you do your homework, this is as good a time as any to start exporting. And also it may be a better time than some because it's not only difficult for the UK, it's difficult for everyone, right? And that throws up opportunities because somebody might not be fulfilling a supply chain from another country because they've got problems in their country. And so then there may be an opportunity for a UK company. So I would say that there are always opportunities and that if you do your homework then you de-risk it and if you work you know we've got lots of services to help you de-risk it so I think it's as good a time as any would be my feeling. That's interesting and it, it, I mean the point also that you're making about you know doing your homework and very often as a, as a professor I look at different firms and of course what is very obvious over time is that Many of these firms are successful, but many other firms fail. Yeah. And <clears throat> of course, I would agree with what you said, doing your homework, you know, lack faith, yeah. was they prepared, of course. But I, I was wondering, from your experience, is there anything else that kind of differentiates those winners from those firms that often fail? Is there a significant driver that you kind of see as a pattern? Well, I suppose my first thing is I would probably question the word failure. Um, so I, I know that when you talk to US colleagues and they see having a business that you start and then 
have to close down as being earning your stripes. So, you know, it's not really failure so much as learning. Um, we tend to think of it as failure in Britain because we don't like getting things wrong. But actually, I think it's quite healthy to have an attitude that you can run multiple businesses and be a serial entrepreneur. So just sorry to, to question the question. That's a bit irritating on me, isn't it? But, you know, so I, I think I wouldn't want to think about it as failure. Um, are there characteristics of firms that succeed? Do you know, I'm sure that academics, I'm sure there's somebody in the room who's written a book on um, the characteristics of firms that succeed and I'm sure that the, that it varies and it probably varies through different time periods you know I think it's a it's a mixture of <clears throat> it's a mixture of homework luck judgment you know all of those things and I think it's those things coming together so it reminds me a little bit and that it also connects to one of the questions I've got here actually uh, I, I often like to study the outliers not just those firms that are successful. Yeah. Uh, and I sometimes like to go back over time to those firms that fail. Okay. And I mean, from a study that I did, uh, I looked at firms that are now successful, but they were not always successful. Okay. So, you know, as you said, they tried, failed, they tried again and failed again, but they tried again and again and again until they got it right. Mm. Uh, and I was, I was wondering, do you think that we've got that mindset are we persistent enough and I'm saying this because right. you know, as professor of international business you know part of my role is to look at these differences across countries and I know that kind of mindset in some countries is right. really rooted in their culture they don't care about failure and as you say sometimes they are proud yeah <laughs> and, and they know that you know there are very important lessons in failure yeah. Do we have that mindset? Are we persistent enough? <laughs> <laughs> I think some people are extraordinarily persistent and some people less so. And I think, you know, if you look at the, the range of acceptance of failure, we're somewhere in the middle, I think. You know, there are some countries that are even more failure averse than we are. And then there are some countries that, that really cope with failure very well. But um, I see a lot of very persistent exporters who, you know, learn from their mistakes. And I guess one of the things I really like about the fact that we have the export champions is that they are willing to share their mistakes, you know, and say to people, oh, yeah, I did that and that didn't work. But this, if you try this, this might, you know, I, I, I then went on and did that. So I think, you know, that kind of, I, I think what I, in a way, the way I'd like to answer your question is, I think by doing more peer to peer support, we can increase the amount of success that we have by firms helping other firms by telling them what they've learned. So I think that's probably the best way to ensure, or the best way that we can help to ensure success anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Even though I'm conscious of time, we've got uh, some time for a couple more questions, is, okay. is, if that's okay <laughs> with you. And the next one is about locations. And again, if I go back to what I was saying, that I was teaching those courses, or this executive course on international business, it was one of the most popular questions. People were coming to me and saying, how do I choose where to locate mm. my company? And of course, there are lots of different uh, decisions to make. Do I start from the country and then choose a location within the country? Or do I choose a location first? I, I want to get in New York and then therefore I yeah. have to go to America. There are lots of things there. And of course, the world is a big place, sure. lots of countries to choose from. So how do you help those companies? I suspect that especially for smaller or medium-sized mm. firms, that can be a daunting exercise. Yeah. Well, so that's where our trade advisors and the Export Academy and also the online tool come in. So the online tool was built by trade advisors using the way that they think about that and the way that they help companies to decide. And then the trade advisors also have, you know, methods. And it's a complex mixture of, you know, what's the competition like? What's the demand like? Um, you know, uh, how easy is it to do business in that country? There are lots of different factors that, again, are very sector in fact niches within sectors specific um, and so that's where working with someone who's done business in that country before um, and has an understanding of different countries and where you know where the, the opportunities might lie can be really really helpful for that because it is quite a mixture of different factors that, that overlay on one another so it's, it's thinking through all those different parameters and then looking at where the biggest option but I saw there is also a tool you mentioned about that, yeah that, uh, that there is a tool that you can go through online and do that. That's um, very interesting. Yeah, uh, yeah. Try can, it. We can use it. I, will see <laughs> it. I, I can use it in my class. Yeah. And tell us, give us some critique. It'd be really helpful to know how you find it. <laughs> Certainly. 
final question before uh -huh. I pass off over to Fiona <laughs> so that we can close and then uh, uh, people can come down if you like to talk to By you as means. you mentioned yeah, earlier. Yeah. Uh, that's a very open question. Any <laughs> final advice to businesses mm. from your experience, from all those things that you've seen, different sectors, different sizes of firms and so on? Well, I think I've given quite a lot of advice on uh, already on sort of, you know, all the sensible stuff about doing business internationally. I suppose probably the one thing I haven't talked about is it is quite a lot of fun. Um, so, you know, some of the stuff I've done internationally is probably the only stuff I've done that my children thought was interesting <laughs> in my career, you know. So I think you can go to some quite interesting countries and meet some quite interesting people and find out and do things that you would never do otherwise. So I, I think it can also be a pleasure. We can always end the Grand Canary and have sun for the entire year. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stop here and pass over back uh, to, uh, to Fiona so that we can close. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much, Marion. I found that really interesting. Um, I was sitting there inevitably, and that lots of people do, I suppose, and think about, well, what works? Um, and there's a lot of focus, I imagine, on that, and certainly academically, but also practically. Um, and even when you find what works, you know, can it be replicated across sectors and, and different types of companies? We assume mm -hmm. sometimes these things can be just, there's a template, you can move it across, uh, and that solves the, the issues, right. but it's never that simple. <laughs> not quite a word that we often use in the in the scientific community but somehow there's something magical where everything comes together in the right ways like you say where there's timing issues there's your judgment call there's all these different things which right. just all come together to make sure that everything is in the right place at the right, right. time and that's hard to predict how this all, all those things come together but sure. very interested also in your comments on the importance of peer-to-peer -peer networks right uh, and it's not just about sharing good practice it's also about sharing failure absolutely uh, and talking about and uh, talking about those and I'll, I'll i'll probably be asking you later you know we often here have the discourse about how bad we are about talking about failure <laughs> and so i'll be interested to hear what your other countries are who are worse than because <laughs> <laughs> i was trying to think who they might be but anyway thank you for a really interesting talk as I say, there is an opportunity to talk to Maria now. Um, um, so please, you know, do come down to the front here and, and, and have conversations. Uh, we have uh, Andy Haldane is going to be joining us on the 9th of June. We're just um, settling on the logistics of that, but it's going to be uh, with the Royal Society of Arts, of which, of course, he's now the CEO. Uh, but he is going to be talking about his work that he did do with Michael Gove when he was a permanent secretary in the levelling up department. So the title that we have recently received is is going to be discussing leveling up what why how so i think that's going to be mm. a really interesting discussion <laughs> and we'll be sharing uh, details with you all shortly so can i just take this opportunity to thank marion again and just to say how proud we are to have her as alumni of our mba program as well thank you very much thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>